Hello and welcome to Rank and File Radio Prairie Edition on CKUW 95.9 FM, Canadian labour news and analysis across Manitoba, Saskatchewan and Alberta. This show is an independent partner with rankandfile.ca and supported by CKUW listeners, Patreon supporters and UCW Local 832. This episode is broadcasting from Winnipeg, Manitoba, Treaty 1 Territory, the original lands of the Cree, Oju Cree, Anishinaabeg, Dakota, and Dene peoples, and the homeland of the Métis Nation. Today's broadcast date is May 12, 2019. I'm your host, Emily Leedham. The 1919 General Strike 100-year anniversary conference in Winnipeg kicked off on Wednesday, May 8th, with labour activists and academics from across Canada congregating at the University of Winnipeg. The intention of the conference was to not only reflect on the lessons of the general strike, but to understand where Canada's labour movement is at today. Specifically, what is the state of the strike in Canada? Keynote speaker, US-based organizer and author of No Shortcuts, Organizing for Power in the New Gilded Age, Jane McAlevey spoke at the Ukrainian Labour Temple on Thursday about what makes an effective strike. If we understand that workers withdrawing their labor is the most powerful thing we can do under capitalism, in a moment that's very scary right now worldwide, then we all have to get better about how do we do that. But the good news is, um, in terms of workers of the world uniting, that in the United States in 2018, we had more workers on strike than we've had in the past 30 years, I think combined. Yeah, by a lot. And the strikes where workers are winning right now, I think is not very different than 1919, but the the strikes where we're winning really big in the US right now have three commonalities between them, three things that we have to do really well at. One is they were 100% out, 100% out, every single worker. Two, they had worked very hard to build broad community support long before the strike began. So the community didn't just rise up and support them. They did serious, deliberate work to make sure that the goals of the strikes were consistent with the broader community and that the broader community was going to stand with them and not the bosses when they went out. And the third commonality of the really successful strikes in 2018 and 2019 in the United States um, is that they started as movements from below in the rank and file. That there were a group of workers in every case who said, we're not sure we love what's happening at the top leadership of our organization, um, and so we're gonna dive in and make it better. That was my point about, like, we need to dive in and make it better. If we understand under capitalism, nothing's more powerful than workers walking off the job. Hello, 1919. And if we have the right politics to keep the troops from mowing us down in the streets, which is, crucial, um, then we have to understand that the same skills that we need to get broadly to another 1919 kind of moment, uh, we need to actually help make sure that we have leadership in our unions that want to wake up and see the community as their number one ally and the thing for which we are going on strike, right? For making a better world. I then sat down with Mike Palasek president of the Canadian Union of Postal Workers to talk about the state of the strike in Canada. Given Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau legislated Cup W back to work last year, caving to corporate pressure concerned about losing profits during the holiday season. The Canadian Union of Postal Workers just got legislated back to work by Trudeau and uh, you called for solidarity pickets and there were several of those happening for a little while. Um, what is kind of the status of that situation right now? What is uh, Cup W in the middle of? Uh, well, we're, we're going through the arbitration process right now. Uh, <coughs> there were uh, a whole number of, of protests uh, and, and picket lines that went up uh, after we called for a, a national campaign of civil disobedience. And I think uh, it's likely that we'll, we'll see more actions in the future to try and put pressure on, on Canada Post to come to the table and actually bargain because at the end of the day, uh, that legislation may be in place, but there's nothing that precludes Canada Post from negotiating an agreement with us. 
And, and so our message to them is to get back to the table and hammer this out uh, because only a negotiated agreement is going to uh, solve these issues and, and uh, restore some sort of labor peace at Canada Post. You cannot legislate labor peace. Mm -hmm. And what kind of work do you think the labor movement needs to do to, you know, like we had the solidarity pickets going on for a while, but then they kind of like faded off and they were kind of one off here or there. Um, what do you think the labor movement needs to do to kind of get stronger at that kind of direct action? Mm -hmm. Well, I, I think we have to start standing together and, and be prepared to take solidarity strike actions when necessary. And I, I come out of the anti-Campbell movement in British Columbia where we had several general strikes. Um, I think that's the direction that labor needs to head. Uh, but that's not just going to happen by itself. Um, there's got to be a lot of organizing done at all levels. Uh, and we've got to get the working class to stand together as a whole because ultimately as the old saying goes, not, not a wheel will turn and not a light bulb shines without the working class. Mm -hmm. And the legal aspect of the strike and, and the potential fines involved with doing a wildcat strike or anything like that um, can pose a barrier to, to some to you know, take those kinds of illegal actions. What do you think, um, do you think that's a significant barrier that holds people back is the prospect of fines and do does the labor movement need to get over that and be willing to you know like invest their 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 resources into taking those risks and taking on that potential cost for the sake of building that strength absolutely i mean nobody wants to pay big fines nobody wants to be levied with fines, nobody wants to be imprisoned or, or, or anything else, mm -hmm. uh, but at the end of the day, we're, we're dealing with major health and safety issues uh, at Canada Post, for example. Um, you can't put a price on people's lives. You can't put a price on health and safety. And uh, if the labor movement uh, is forced to uh, take heavy fines in order to save workers' lives, that's worth doing or in order to stop major ish injuries, mm -hmm. that's worth doing. And, and one of the great things that happened uh, with us uh, is that the labor movement came together uh, and guaranteed interest-free loans for CUPW uh, in case we needed to do that. Mm -hmm. um, that kind of solidarity uh, needs to be built and needs to be spread. Mm -hmm. And Jane McAlevey uh, spoke last night. Were you at the, the talk last night? Oh, I missed it. Oh, you missed it. Okay. Are you familiar with, with her work at all? Or, um, a little bit, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, I guess, yeah, I would just ask if uh, young organizers are interested in learning more about building up militancy and building up the skills that she talks about, um, are there any kind of resources that you would recommend for, for young organizers to, to check out or learn from? Well, I, I think there's there's a lot. Um, mm -hmm. there, there's obviously volumes and volumes and many books and videos and everything else that talk about rank and file organizing. But really, there's nothing that teaches like experience. And, and my advice to young activists is, is to get out in there and do that. Mm -hmm. um, and I think you have to build uh, from the shop floor up. And that's going to mean that sometimes you're targeted and sometimes you win and sometimes you lose. But, you know, it, as Nelson Mandela said, I never lose. I either win or I learn. Mm-hmm. Awesome. Uh, great. Well, do you have any um, more general kind of final thoughts or comments or things that you would like to say about kind of the state of labor in, in Canada right now? Well, I, I think labor is at a bit of a crossroads, to be honest. We're, we're living in a period where capitalism is in crisis. The uh, post-war compromise has been thrown out the window. Uh, increasingly, uh, we're saying that the, the right to strike only exists until the moment you use it, and then they take it away. Or it only exists as long as your strike isn't effective and doesn't cost anything. Um, so when you really take a look at it, Canada actually has some of the most restrictive laws on the right to strike in the world. You know, most of the world 
people have the right to uh, walk off the job over matters not covered by a collective agreement. Mm -hmm. Here, uh, we're not allowed to strike except, you know, every three or four years when a contract comes up at a very narrow time, and then when you do, they take that away. Um, so I think at a certain point, we're going to have to throw the legality out the window. Mm -hmm. um, let's be honest, the labor movement wouldn't exist today if if uh, everybody followed the laws all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, it wasn't long ago that unions were illegal. It wasn't long ago that all strike action was illegal. Mm -hmm. It wasn't long ago that you could be thrown in prison for the crime of calling a man a scab. Uh, but that didn't stop people from fighting back. It didn't stop people from organizing. Mm -hmm. And it's the reason uh, that we have some of the living standards that we've been able to build up today. Mm -hmm. Increasingly, those are under threat. We're seeing uh, people pushed into poverty. We're seeing attacks against pensions, against benefits. Uh, wages have been stagnant at best for, for a long time. Mm -hmm. uh, so we need to reevaluate uh, the methods that we're using and, and decide what works and what doesn't. Because at the end of the day, nothing happens without workers. On Saturday, May 11th, the Canadian Centre for Policy Alternatives hosted a talk by Boots Riley, rapper with the legendary hip-hop ensemble The Coup, author, activist, and director of Sorry to Bother You, a mind-bending dystopic film that centres heavily around labour organizing. I sat down with Boots to talk about Sorry to Bother You and why radical labour organizing is essential for fighting corporate power and giving teeth to social and economic justice. Why did you feel it was so important to center labor organizing in Sorry to Bother You? Well, um, because the, the uh, fulcrum point of power under capitalism is at the point of exploitation. Um, and, you know, most folks know that, but when we go to organize, we don't organize around that point. Mm -hmm. like, and I'm not just talking about liberals, I'm talking about radicals as well. We do everything that's based around spectacle, about bringing attention to oppression and, um, and other losses of freedom that come under capitalism, but we don't organize at the point of, of uh, production. And, and that's where our power lies because of, of, of how pivotal it is. So. Um, you know, I thought it was important to put that forward as a, um, as a way to, uh, as a way to build a movement, you know, mm -hmm. is to, you know, I'm, I'm hoping that what we see is a new radical mass militant labor movement that can, uh, use the withholding of labor as a strategy and tactic. Um, not only t at first for uh, wage hikes and for uh, changing of conditions on the job, but also for broader social justice movement goals, turning into then a, a, a bigger movement that, um, that, that uses that withholding of labor in power blocks that can then um, start to form a revolutionary movement. And this would have to be done with radical leadership because in the US, I'm not sure about here, but we have uh, these Taft-Hartley laws which are against solidarity strikes. Mm -hmm. Meaning, if you wanna organize Burger King, really the only way to organize Burger King is if the Burger King down the road can go on strike along with it. That's illegal in the United States. Mm -hmm. And it's only illegal because it works. Right. And, and so it's going to take a movement that is willing to break the law. Yeah, definitely. That's been a, a kind of theme here as well. I talked to the president of the Canadian Union of Postal Workers just yesterday, and they got legislated back to work after being on strike by the government. And so it's sort of one of those things where to get out of this sort of very restrictive labor regime that we have up here in Canada as well, like we're going to have to, yeah, be willing to push the boundaries of what is legal to actually yeah. win because they're set up 
to contain us. And right? that's why I'm saying it has to be done with a radical vision. And by that, I mean an open radical vision where people are saying, look, this movement is so that we can create a new world, mm-hmm. so that we can create a new society. One, th- uh, because that's true, that's what we want. But two, it shows people who the leaders of that movement which could be fluctuating or, you know, could be done in a different way, who knows, but who the, what, what the leaders of that movement want. And it inspires people to not think like, to, to not get frustrated and like, okay, we did this battle and it won, but this other little battle didn't win. You know, the, the point is to connect all of these struggles. Mm-hmm. So it needs to be with a radical vision and it needs to be radicals leading it because it's going to take breaking the law. Mm-hmm. And sometimes, without that radical vision, um, people aren't necessarily willing to, you know. And so I'm, I'm saying this, like, instead of going to jail for breaking windows, we can go to jail for doing solidarity, for leading solidarity strikes. And, and that will even, you know, endear people more to uh, the idea that this fight is for real. Mm-hmm. And how has the labor movement responded to your film and the message of, well, of that? Well, it's interesting. As it was, before it kind of came out in theaters, you know, we had been taking it around to festivals, and I was actually trying to get, um, you know, lab- you know, unions on board, like, hey, have your people watch this. We'll do screenings and stuff. And they were a little kind of like, what's the story again? How is it? What, you know, they right. didn't understand that, you know, maybe they even, you know, uh, understood the part that there was a labor struggle in it. But I think it's hard to understand how the movie uh, will be received by people if you hadn't seen it yet. And so after that, definitely, it's been, um, you know, people are like, we show it all the time. I was in Baltimore and somebody said... Um, that their job, I don't remember what it was, they'd never had a union before, and um, when they were, uh, when just before, they didn't know whether they were all going to vote, they were all getting together to vote on whether there was a union mm-hmm. or not, and just before they were getting ready to vote, um, somebody yelled, Equisapiens, let's be out! And then everybody, <laughs> most people voted for the union, and then, oh God, that's amazing. and then, um, and then um, this th- theater workers in Utah sent an email because they formed a union, and it was they said because they saw "Sorry to Bother You." Wow! And um, and so they got a message to me through someone else I know. Yeah. Um, and people are looking into being involved in it and in and, and stuff and mm-hmm. yeah yeah you have a um um kind of critique in the film a little bit as well and you've referred to it earlier but the the spectacle of organizing and i'm interested in your thoughts on the role of uh, art in organizing yeah. and in labor organizing well, well we need spectacle in general i mean it's how we communicate mm-hmm. things like that i, I don't I don't think, um, and and we need inventive ways for that spectacle, but the problem is when it's disconnected from an actual, uh, a a struggle that has, when it's disconnected from from a struggle that has a leverage point of power, Mm -hmm. then um, it kind of instills a a feeling of futility Mm -hmm. on the people um, consuming that art or, or spectacle even if it's just like we got 10,000 people in the street that are saying no more war you know right? that's one of the most depressing things that ever happens right, right. like because yeah. people are like hey we were there was 10,000 of us last month in the street saying no more war yeah and absolutely nothing happened right right, right? and because we've been kind of lying to people about how power works. Mm. You know, I include myself in that, in the sense that we've been, the, 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 the left, since the, the dawning of the new left in the 60s, has made it be about 
getting your voice out, letting your voice be heard, exposing the lies, Mm -hmm. this and that, because it was running away from class struggle. And it simplified it to this, so to the point where we were telling people, if we get enough people on the street, matter of fact, there's a revolutionary organization, they call themselves revolutionary, and that's what they say. You get enough people on the street, and you don't know what happens. Everything, you know. But we saw that during the Iraq war in the early 2000s, there were millions of people on the street all mm-hmm. over the world. Right. And obviously that didn't happen. So similarly with art, um, it tends to be about exposing the problem. Mm-hmm. And um, that's not enough. Right. Yeah. yeah. And not only is it not enough, it could have a the an adverse reaction if it's not connected to, you know, how you actually change that thing that you exposed. Right, yeah. Yeah. Um, so we're seeing kind of a increase in visible white supremacist organizing in the States, also up here in Canada as well, um, anti- immigrant rhetoric, anti-migrant rhetoric, uh, refugees, anti-black racism. Um, What are some examples of really solid anti-racist organizing that's connected to the labor movement that um, you feel is really effective? Um, Well, that's a question that still has to be solved. There are some some, um, instances that I know about, and and, um, there are probably more, but... um, so, for instance, um, in the Bay Area, uh, the Longshoremen uh, organized it, a union in the, tw- in the 30s. And they were said to be, Longshoremen are the people that bring the stuff off, that get the, the containers off the ships. Mm-hmm. And they were said to be the least skilled workers out there, like less skilled than custodians Mm -hmm. because they're just lifting things and and least organizable because there were all these different sites. There wasn't just one like port site where the ship comes in. It's all over the place and they were getting fired all the time. Right. Um, And so, you know, but they organized this militant strike in which they were actually fighting the... uh, fighting the the, the uh, National Guard, and no, not the, the state militia maybe, but tanks were brought out. Mm-hmm. Now during this, this, uh, during this, this uh, struggle, the, the leader of that, that union was a socialist and he knew how things had played out before. There's a long history of racist incidents that also are connected to strikes because what happens is the, uh, the boss will go hire people from a community that they usually don't employ Mm. and be like, okay, we'll bring them as, as the replacement workers. And, uh, so, um, racism is, is built up in that way. Um, but so he headed this off at the past and he went to the black neighborhood in Oakland and said, look, went to like bars and churches and places where people hung out and said, look, I know they're going to try to hire y'all as uh, scabs, but if you join our strike instead and don't scab, then we'll make sure that most of the jobs here go to the black community. And to this day, longshoremen in in the Bay Area are 80% black. And they joined the the union and didn't scab, right? And so that, but it was a, it ended up being a, you know, a, a form of unity. Um, there's a kind of, um, there's a, the story that's told of what happened in Maytuan, Alabama, in the movie Maytuan. Um, all of, a lot of that is fictionalized, but some of that is is real. Um, in which black workers also joined with white workers and did that. Um, so many uh, stories in the Midwest, in the United States, and auto workers of things like that happening. Um, I, I, but here's the thing: is that we talk about so we talk about multiracial unity of some sort or anti-racism of some sort, and it's almost impossible to do that without a struggle that demands it. 
right? If we don't have struggles that demand that kind of unity, mm -hmm. then we don't get it. So, mm -hmm. for instance, one of the first things that I got involved in as a teenager was just supporting the Watsonville cannery workers strike. And, um, and this was more of just observating, uh, observational and passing out flyers for them. But what was happening there was that for the past bunch of years, there had been three groups of people working for the cannery workers. So there was uh, Filipino families, Mexican families, and, um, and Portuguese families. And there, was a, there were big divisions, like the kids were fighting each other. There was like a lot of racist ideas about each other. And there were, had been like struggles to stop that from happening. Like how do we get our communities together, those sorts of things. Mm -hmm. But when they went, when they decided they needed to go on strike, then they realized how much they needed each other. And all of a sudden you started having there be a re look, if we, if one of these groups don't join, strike isn't happening. Mm -hmm. And so there was a material reason, a, a, a material reason behind a material struggle mm -hmm. that called for that. And the truth is, there's a material reason um, uh, for there to be unity in the working class. However, if we're not engaged in a struggle that calls for that, mm. it starts to become theoretical and right-wing ideas can seep in and take over. Right, right. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to chat and everything. This has been really interesting and awesome. Uh -huh. Do you have any kind of final um, thoughts or comments or things that you'd like to share? Um, no, I, I think um, I think one thing that I'd say is that um, maybe three weeks before the Occupied movement happened, there's no way you would have said that every town in the U.S. would have an Occupy encampment, which was claiming to be representing the 99% versus the 1%. Mm -hmm. But you did have it, and it surprised everybody. And this is something uh, we can have a mass radical militant labor movement that changes the world, that helps us build a revolutionary movement. And that can happen, and that can happen in our lifetime. That was Boots Riley, rapper, author, activist, and director of Sorry to Bother You, who was in Winnipeg May 11th, speaking at an event organized by the Canadian Centre for Policy Alternatives. It's clear that the future of regaining the full power of the strike in Canada will require illegal action. It will also require activists within the labor movement willing to agitate and organize to build up workers' willingness to take those actions. But as Mike Palasek said, the best education is experience. And in the spirit of celebrating the 1919 general strike, I hope that Rank and File Radio Prairie Edition and RankandFile.ca can be resources to help encourage and facilitate that kind of organizing in Canada today. You've been listening to Rank and File Radio Prairie Edition on CKUW 95.9 FM, Canadian labor news and analysis across Manitoba, Saskatchewan, and Alberta. This show is supported by CKUW listeners, UCW Local 832, and Patreon supporters like David, Darren, and Clinton. Thanks for keeping the show going. Subscribe to Rank and File Radio on iTunes, Google Podcasts, or Stitcher, and don't forget to check out rankandfile.ca for labor news and analysis across Canada. This is Emily signing off. I'll see you next week.